Welcome, everybody, to the Probate Mastery Weekly Group Coaching Call. Rosie, you're back. Good to see you here. Bill Gross, thanks for being here, sir. How can we serve you guys today? Does anybody have anything you want to work on, have questions about, any topic, any transaction engineering? Who had appointments this week? I have a question on the missing heir. Okay. <clears throat> Hi, everyone. Uh, Rosie here from Austin, Texas. So I have this seller. They are, brother passed away, had no children, no one. He was just a single guy. House is left to mom and the sister. And uh, one of the sister has passed away. She only had one son and that nephew cannot be located. They have, they've been waiting on this for six, seven months now. They hired a pri private investigator. According to them, he was on drugs. They don't know where he is. He's nowhere to be found. I reached out to real estate attorney. They're already with the probate attorney when I met them. My real estate attorney said that they need to go through a probate. Their probate guy said that you can't do anything. Even if you try to sell the property, you're going to come back to court. So I know there are other missing heirs out there. How should we go about it? The only way I know to get through this is with private investigators. And the question usually becomes, well, who's going to pay for that? So what I would recommend is file probate. So you you do have two heirs located, correct? You said yes. two sisters. Yes. So have are one of them willing to be the administrator? So have one of them file as the administrator and get the letters of testamentary. Initiate the probate process. At that point, then they can hire. Is there any cash in the estate bank account? Yes. Yeah, so there's no cash, but sister has money. So I apologize. Let me reiterate. They've already hired a probate attorney. They've already filed for probate before the private investigator. I just didn't know what to tell them next that, okay, you've done all this. Their probate attorney is saying that you're going to come back to the court. Even if you sell the property, he's not giving any solution on missing air. Are they with the wrong attorney? They're just following the law. Like you, any attorney is going to look at succession law and say, okay, we know this person exists. We, we have to have their approval to, to transfer, you know, property. And so you already hired, the attorney hired a private investigator? No, the sister did. She hired mm -hmm. it, she paid for it, asking me what to do next. I was like, I'll get back with you after Tuesday. <laughs> so I don't know what to tell them. Uh, Bill, do you have something you want to add? Of course, it depends on your state law. I've seen in, in California, Los Angeles regularly, they just, when the property is sold, the money goes to the estate. They don't distribute it to the very end. But in the course of the probate, there's a process where they just stipulate what they've done to attempt to locate the heir, including hiring a private attorney. And if the judge approves, that's all they can do. All you can do is all you can do. And I've seen that be approved numerous times. So why the attorney yeah. would tell you that? Otherwise, again, I think, Rosie, you're in Texas maybe. The law's a little different. But in California, we're pretty strict. That would sell through as long as you make a reasonable effort and document it. Yeah. Hmm. They aren't even willing to leave his share into an account somewhere uh, in an estate account or something and move forward. They just don't want to sit on this uh, real estate anymore. That's what I would do if, if I were in that position. What I would request from the, the attorney proposed to the court is, listen, we'll escrow the distribution amount for this third party. And let's please ask the court to, to, approve, to, to approve the sale and even close out the probate with those funds in escrow if he ever shows up, if the family's willing to do that. And I don't know. I'm not an attorney. John Fraker, I don't think, is here today. I'd be interested to hear his opinion. But that's what I would ask. And you would think the attorney should be incentivized to get it closed so he gets paid, right? So yeah. if they're – that's some, something, unfortunately – Pareto's principle is present everywhere, even in law. If you're not with percent that are really good attorneys, it may be time to go find one that's in the 20%, but that's going to keep pushing. I've found this with title companies. Like when you have to locate heirs, they come back to me and expect me to do it. I'm like, no, that's your job. I put the deal together. Yeah. Like you need to get everybody here to sign. And a, and a really good attorney, a really good title company, the title issues won't be your problem. They'll be the attorney's problem. They'll move through those things. So same with probate. If they're not getting it done, just say, listen, we're, the family's going to request new counsel. And do you have attorney, do, do you know any aggressive probate attorneys in Austin yet? Yes, I, I have three of them and I submitted a call with them right away. But in the meantime, I wanted to ask our group today to see if I can do some alternative work. So I'm hoping all three of them will give me a better answer than the one she has right now. Then the question would be, who's going to pay the probate attorney's fee? So here's what I was thinking, and maybe you can give me some ideas, Chad. I was thinking the house is in probate, it needs work. What if I get my end buyer to make an offer on the property in a way that she's able to cover her old attorney's cost 
and uh, come up with a solid contract where he can release some money to her as earnest money instantaneously released or something. So she doesn't have to be out of pocket and um, start the file with a new probate attorney who can look at it up front and say, yeah, I can do this. You guys have done all the check boxes. We just needed a more creative probate attorney to put the deal together. Huh? No, I'm not an agent here. I'm approaching the property as an investor. And maybe if they don't like anything, then maybe we can go on the market, that kind of deal. Okay. Sorry, my audio was, was not clear. So you are, you're a principal. You're coming at this from an investment standpoint, yeah. not a brokerage. And who's the end buyer you're referencing? Do you know who that is? My, my investor buyer. Uh, that I partner up with all the time who fixes the property. So you've already discussed it with that attorney that, that you said the good probate attorney you've discussed this with? Yeah, I'm waiting on answers. None of it have answered yet. I just did it today morning. Before I took action on anything, I'd want to have that conversation. And so what's, what does this process look like? How do we take this over civilly without him digging in or causing problems at the court? And, and how do we make sure he gets paid? And that could be a good way to go ahead and bring the offer in with a heavy earnest money deposit and then pay out that probate attorney and then do, and then go ahead and close the real estate, let the money sit in us and in, in the estate's yeah. bank account. And then if they can find a way to close the probate then escrow the distribution for that third party. Yeah, I think that's the best you can do. But I would, I think what you're going to like your key component here is making sure you have the, a, a good attorney that's going to quarterback this and, and they're on board with your plan. That's right. That's absolutely right. Finding some creative top attorneys. They have like little, their secret bar association. Let me know when Austin reaching out. I yeah. Let me ask you this. Did the Martha had a good point. If he was on drugs, he could be dead, but I'm assuming the, the private investigator looked for death certificates, right? Yeah, he did. They didn't find anything. They're not able to locate him at all. Like any phone okay. number. And they've like even tried to send some certified letters on his old, old address. The last re uh, address that they were able to find no response at all. So did they look through, did part of his report include law enforcement checks? I will ask all this, but she was so well prepared. Because if your PI wasn't that thorough or didn't have access, maybe it's time to talk to the local PD and say, listen, can we, can you help me search and see where was the last, the last known location? Was that in Texas? Yeah. No, I would say start with local, start with local law enforcement and say, listen, we're trying to do a federal search. I mean, he could be in jail. And if that PI didn't do a thorough job, I would want to know what, what he did. What was his exhaustive effort if it was in fact exhaustive? Because if he was, if he's on the wrong side of Pareto's principle, and maybe they didn't get into a federal database and search penal records and he could be in a prison somewhere. If he didn't search nationally for death certificates, he might not be alive. So I would first scrutinize the PI work that you've already had done. How good was he? How exhaustive was the report? Can I see the report? And if you feel like he did a good job and he was exhaustive in, in checking federal databases for death, incarceration, things like that, then it's probably time to move toward the alternative plan of how do we move forward with this and escrow what he's due in case he ever does show up. That's a very good point. Actually, you know what? I have my follow-up conversation now. So that's awesome. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks, Rosie. All right. Who else has something to troubleshoot? Who's here for their first time? Yeah, this Anybody? is Eric. I don't I'm I'm not a first timer, but I will, uh, I actually want to set up a separate entity LLC for the branded name that I'm operating under. So I just wanted to know how I should go about setting that up. I know you've talked, to, I've never heard anybody break down the way that you've broken it down to really protect yourself and keep, keep entities separate. Now I do have a parent real estate company that I take all of my income, mainly just assignment deals, rehab income, which is separate from any rental income that I have. But I do want to set up one that is strictly for the probate and estate side of my business. That'll be under the branded name, Settle Your Estate LLC. And I guess the questions that I have is my current parent company is out of Florida. I live in Michigan. How should I structure that? How should I set it up? Should it be a Florida entity, a Michigan entity? And then what kind of liability might, might be exposed there that I could uh, minimize? It's, this is for investment activity only? Correct. Yes. And what you're calling the parent company, what's that company do? And is it single member? So that is a single member LLC out of Florida. And I'm the sole operator under that. That basically is just assignment deals and rehab income that comes through that. Okay. So it's not really holding assets, but it just, it's Nothing just a pass through for cash. No assets whatsoever. So you could just open a series LLC in, a, in Florida underneath of that. If it's basically the, uh, under this, uh, is it safe to say it would be the same activity? You're just, yeah. 
I guess the difference is like, I've got a couple of minor expenses for the calling team and things like that. Maybe it's not even necessary. Maybe I can continue to receive income I don't, for the probate <sighs> deals through my main parent company. I don't think it is. Like if you have clearly different business activity, like if what you're doing with the entities are is different, then it, then it makes sense. But I think for you, you just need to grab a DBA for that company okay. so you can have the brand you want and, and have that be compliant. But you could you can DBA as whatever it is now and the new brand. So if you grab that DBA, you don't have any real assets in the entity to, to put at risk. It's just a pass through. So and now my, my answer would be different. If you said, well, I've got 15 houses held in that entity, then I would say, okay, let's start to separate. That's a clear, that let's make a holding company and then an active, an active investing company. But I don't think you're there right now. What I would say is when you start holding, when you start holding assets, that's when you should probably set up a holding company, leave this one as your active investing entity, anything you want to hold, you'll move over to that. But for me, like everything I have is our single member Florida LLCs with the, the I one exception. I still have one Virginia company that's a self-directed IRA owns that company. But Florida has very business favorable laws. Uh, obviously they have really great tax laws with no state income income tax. So that's what I would recommend. Now, something that you may consider, and that's something I've got to meet with my tax advisors on, the current proposal on the table to double the size of the IRS, hire 86,000 new employees and pour billions of dollars into basically auditing software. If you guys are, are using pass-through entities, don't be surprised if you get audited in the next 10 years. So just make sure you're above board because they, they seem to be targeting any of those beneficial loopholes, even if you're not breaking rules, it's still your burden to defend yourself in an audit. So okay. as much as I hate to admit that, we, I will probably be audited in the next decade. I'm not afraid of it because I'm not doing anything wrong, but I have taken advantage of what advantages are there for me. So it's, it's talk to your tax advisor about what they think is coming. Maybe I'm being a little too cautious about it and but it's not passed yet it's not law but that's it's a proposal they're looking to clean up as much corporate tax as they can that's one thing to be aware of where with the s corp designation otherwise you can just set it up as a single member llc and then it'll, it'll just be a pass through everything passes through but with the s corp designation paying yourself a reasonable salary you can save a significant amount once you're making over one hundred fifty thousand a year in that in that entity you can save a significant amount of money on fica but right now, I think you probably have the entity that you need. I would just get, I think it's 10 bucks to get a DBA through the state of Florida and okay. then you're covered. Should I be concerned that the majority of my income, if not all of my income comes from the state of Michigan, not from Florida? It's tough with, for you and you're in the state, your receipts are coming from in the state. Like Correct. you, you are paying Michigan income tax as a person, right? Correct. Yeah. I, I think you're fine. You have it. It's a pass through. You're getting a Schedule C, and it's you're filing a Michigan State tax return, so you're paying. Okay, okay. perfect, awesome. Thank you for that. Anton, what are you working on this week? What are you buying, man? Before you get started, have, show show us your surroundings. Where are you? Right there. Yes, sir. It's a nice day. It was uh, 37 degrees this morning in Idaho, and now it's getting up to like low 70s. So and it's somewhere around 190 feet. I was wondering why your, your picture is a little fuzzy. I, I invested in a business where they're doing remote wholesaling and I'm really old school and it makes me really nervous, but I'm just trying to feel my way through it. And so we just put a couple of deals on the contract over in Indiana, Evansville area. So when you and, say you invested in the business, like you bought the small business? I bought 20% ownership in the business. I met someone through Facebook and it just seemed like a great opportunity. He's got three or four different revenue streams that he, he got in there and just hiring a team and, and just trying to do the remote thing because it sounds like it's where a lot of people are going right now. So someone in our community that I want you to connect with is Dave Gwen out of Denver, Colorado. Have you and Dave talked? I do not. I have not, no. And thank you. For so look up Dave Gwen. He's been remote wholesaling from Colorado in, excuse me, in Florida with pro his primary I, I think he may do other lead types but his primary uh lead source is probate so he's he's really figured out how to systematically uh build get engagement build rapport and, and get these deals done even from 1500 miles away so make sure you connect with dave gwen out of denver he's in our face so it's group. okay so it's g-w-e-n no g-w-y-n i believe y-n 
Copy. Okay. He does it locally in Denver as well as in Florida. So he's. Yep. That's my bread and butter. I like my backyard. I like being able to go in, touch it, smell it, feel it. So yeah, but I, I definitely connect with him. Thank you very much. Where, uh, whereabouts in Michigan are you right now? In Plainwell, between Grand Rapids and uh, Kalamazoo. Good, a good friend of mine, his father lives here. We're we're free labor. We're building decks and helping his dad out for. Oh, awesome! And it sounds like you're gonna have some fun on the bikes too. Yeah, we're, we're definitely gonna play. We don't work too hard. We just act like it. <laughs> we're gonna build the deck, at least do our, our our duties, and then we'll go play. Oh, gotcha. Keep me in mind again for the end of the summer. If you want to pretend that you're working over here in Spokane area. Yeah, we're looking at hitting that later, probably in September. Yeah. On the way back, yeah. back through. Yeah, I remember you saying that, so that's why, yeah. All right, guys, who else? Anybody have anything to share? Anything that's working well for you? Anything that's not working? Places you're getting stumped? Yeah. I can see you, Chris. Go ahead. Thanks. Um, been the band for a couple of years, and eventually I'm going to actually start here. So <laughs> quick question on uh, pre-probates that become becoming a big thing lately the numbers that they give people for pre-probate is where are they getting that from is it family members i can't imagine it is a dead person's cell phone number usually not it's usually just built off of a skip trace if you can find a match point between person a and person b so if you have if you can reference jane doe had a son john doe and he and you have a known address in this zip code then can you find a cell phone number for that person and Pre-probate is challenging uh, because it's a shooting in the dark. Imagine if you have a family with three kids, you have to, it's almost impossible to deduce which one is the most responsible. But typically the administrator, whether it's being appointed by the will or being appointed by the survivors, typically it's the most responsible person in the family. So it, it's, you may call and muddy the water with two or three people trying to figure out which one's right. You may be peeling scabs. I'm not a huge fan of it from a phone prospecting standpoint because you can really damage your reputation in a hurry and in a smaller market, especially if, it, if you come off the wrong way. So I think it's a pretty, it's a pretty risky way to do it. Now that said, there are softer approaches where it's not an inbound phone call. You can use Facebook advertising to offer them something of value, get them to opt in. So, you know, here's a guide for families who have lost a loved one. And it's, here's how you handle asset preservation. Here's how you handle asset disposition. Here's what probate is here, but you can do it with a very soft approach. And I think a lot of people, that's a lot of people are selling those leads now and those it's going to make, they're going to be so closed up, almost nothing will work. I, if you want to work in that space, I recommend taking the that value first approach. Get a really good blog and a YouTube channel and put good content out there. Stuff that's actually valuable to them. Like how do you choose the right attorney to help your family and in, in, when they lose a loved one? And, and you can start to talk about probate versus probate exemptions. And some of them aren't going to be probate. To say something is pre-probate is, nah, they don't know. They don't know what the value of that person's estate was. And every right. state has a different small estate exemption limit. So it's they're, they're, the reason I was willing to put my name and, and a good chunk of my career on probate is because I saw these families and I saw how much of a, a difference I could make. But I also saw that they were ready. So it was a median, when I've pulled the national data from the all the leads data, what I've, when I've analyzed that it's a median of 68 days from the date of death until the date of filing. Some families are two years, some go the next day, but on, as a median, it was 68 days. So what that told me was, and it's, it was consistent with, with my own business in Roanoke. So typically death happens, family takes care of the funeral, the family goes over, goes through heirlooms. And then they just sit with it for a couple of months. Eventually the, the bills come and then the next set of bills come and the cash runs out and they're like, oh shit, we have got to do something. And that's when it becomes that kind of that signal flare of petitioning the court for probate is, hey, we're ready to deal with this. And for me, that's, that was the, the earliest point I was willing to attach my reputation to entering that conversation was the, at probate. However, I, having done this for eight, eight plus eight or nine years, I do see a ton of value in getting further upstream than that. And I'm looking for one of the things I would like to do in my career, what's left of it, is to actually find out how to get upstream of estate planning. 
and 95% of Americans go to their death. They, they know, in case you guys haven't realized this, you're dying every day, each of us. Every one of you guys is getting older and dying. I don't know how many days you have left, but you're in the process of dying right now. And I, it was that realization to me came at 35. I set up my own estate plan, my own long-term care plan, my own insurances. And I can't get my own parent, like my own family members to do it. But I'm watching my grandparents go through this right now, like struggling to make a decision. Or do we keep suffering and putting our kids through this or do we sell the family farm so Medicaid will help us out? And it's a really tough position for people who are in. So I really want to find a way to get even further upstream than that. How can we serve these families so they're not going through probate? And we take them through trust administration. The reason I'm saying all that is the way to do that is to put valuable content out to your marketplace. So write about ways to avoid, avoid probate, write about ways to avoid this and that, or ways to, to accomplish certain things. And over time, if that's a space you're interested in, if you put enough of that value out there, it will basically, it'll insulate your reputation and people will come to you. Long answer, really long answer in summary, I, I support it if you're playing the long game. And you're willing to do that kind of work and really build like a transitional advisor kind of role in order to earn that real estate business. So that's kind of my take on it. There's like, you can, I would say the easiest way to get started, like direct marketing to that list without having to get on the phones and really kind of hurt people or, or hurt your own reputation, get your list pulled into a, a custom audience in Facebook match okay. on the first name, last name, phone numbers, and then you just run ads like that with that content. Like what, run an ad, like what to do and what to do in Des Moines, Iowa, when you lose a family member in Des Moines, Iowa, and just have you and a probate attorney talking about, okay, this is what happens if your, if your heir had less than 50,000. This is what happens if they have more than 50,000 probate. This is what happens had you had a living, if you do, or had you had a living trust, this is what it would look like. And it's, there's no strong sell there. There's not, not even a real strong call to action. It's a trust building piece. So when everyone else is calling, hey, is this John Doe? Listen, I heard Harry Doe died. He was your father. And John Doe is triggered. His ego says, who the fuck is this? So while they're trying that approach, if you can put that something out there in front of them, it helps educate them and comfort them and move them through that process, the process of mourning and grieving, but also administ administrating the estate. Then I think over time, you'll, you won't have any competition, no matter how many people are buying that list, like with probate. But that's how I would approach it. If you want to, if you want to hunt with a laser, you still can, thanks to Facebook. Just don't be so direct that you, they know you're targeting them just because of that. Make it look like a general message to the public, and then you won't trigger them. Hey, Chad, on a follow-up on that, I ended up at a seminar I thought was going to be a probate a lawyer seminar, and it ended up being a retirement tax person here in our city. And so he's basically advising people on how to set up for retirement and that kind of stuff and how to avoid taxes, basically, during retirement, watch your taxes. Is there something that we can do to help them where we can, where it can be a win-win, do you think? Or is retirement too soon to be talking about that, do you think? Too soon to be talking about an estate plan? I, that's what I'm thinking. I, I think estate plan is a good thing. But estate plan and how would that be a win-win for our business? Role of the person hosting that seminar? They're a, they're a CPA. They're looking for lawyer and their, their plan is to help them to set up a state plan to where they don't pay as much taxes during retirement. Okay. And they already have the attorney. So when they get a, a hand raised in that seminar, they already have the attorney in mind. That they're yeah. I talked to them about that. We had a meeting. I talked to them afterwards and they said, look, we can help you. If you want to do something, I've got a guy here that will help you set up the trusts or estates or they don't do it themselves. I think like here, this is definitely, I hope you've already considered them a member of your team. That's a really good CPA to have on your team. I've found that with a lot of CPAs, that's the one team member that's really hard to fill the spot because they're like, yeah, man, they just need to file final tax returns. No big deal. And I'm like, come on, man. If you're willing to answer their questions, you can take, take their business. Yes, that client is not, or that person's not going to be a client. They're dead. But if you can serve these people and connect them with just like this guy, 
guys doing? Connect them with a registered investment advisor to help them understand what the options are for the life insurance distribution. Connect mm-hmm. them to a tax, to long-term care insurance agents, like whoever it might be. But, and Martha said, look for, Martha, jump in if, if you've got a microphone. Yeah, uh, in my previous life, I was an enrolled agent. I did a state and trust tax returns. Enrolled agents are different than CPAs in that they focus on tax. They've passed a two-day exam on tax law and might be a better person in this situation. I I saw you made a comment on that. What what do you mean by... Enrolled agent, you take a two-day exam given by the IRS on tax law, which entitles you to practice before the IRS, represent the public just as a CPA could all the way up to tax court. And if you wanted to take more classes and pass another exam, you can actually go to tax court. So um, they'll be in the tax how, prep. How would you find an enrolled agent? I'm asking basic questions here. Yeah, there's an organization, National Association of Enrolled Agents. Uh, also, you can just Google enrolled agent and there should be some coming up. And these enrolled agents, when you say enrolled, they're enrolled to with the IRS issues. Is that what it is? Yeah, they, an enrolled agent is qualified to prepare all kinds of tax returns and to represent the public for audits, whatever. So you do you deal with the IRS just the same as a CPA would, okay. except a CPA does more than just taxes. CPA does all sorts of things. Enrolled okay. agents focus on taxes. And, taxes. and there's no state licensure with that, just a federal designation, correct? Right, just federal. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. It's good to know you've got that person in your community, Chris. Like, that's probably a really good partner that you can do some things with. And I would encourage you to find a role in the seminars, like the next time they do one. Have a seat in the room, be a part of their panel to answer real estate questions that those folks might have. That could be a a good way. That's one of the things, Roger Lisi, I I haven't seen him here today, but he's really good at finding places to add value. Radio shows, courtrooms, you name it. Bill Gross is actually, he's really good at that too. Like he attends court just to help people with real estate questions while they're in that environment and he earns business for that. So that's something, if I were you, I would want to seat in that room every time they do a seminar, be there as the real estate guy. And you, you never know. These people obviously have assets to protect or they wouldn't be there. So it's a pretty damn good room to prospect in. So get in there and engage with them. Try to find ways to provide value. For example, one of the things you could talk about in the next meeting is what happens if the step-up basis goes away on a federal level? What does that mean for your family? And as a real estate professional, you get up and talk about that. To let the, the CPAs back you up and then you build trust. So you know, it's, we have over 60 million baby boomers will pass away in the next 40 years. These right. folks are going to be of the age. Their friends are going to be losing their parents, their aunts, their uncles. Like they're, they're going to be able to, if you build trust and you build that reputation in that room, if you have 30 new people every month and you can do something like that, holy crap, man, how many referrals are you going to get? Like you're going to be that guy, like the guy, the real estate guy that you can trust to not sell you, but lead you. And that's what I would say you should do with this is is don't like, I would look again a little bit longer term, but I think you can monetize the hell out of that relationship by providing value to them and the people in their seminars, but you're going to get referrals and have some sort of a leave behind. So you get an opportunity to leave your, your contact info with them, like maybe make a, a step up basis fact sheet with your brand on the bottom and talk about like, this is what the current, like in column A, this is what this, the current step-up basis rules are and the history of that. And then column B, this, these are the proposed changes uh, for 2021 and beyond. Anyways, I'm just spitballing. That's one thing I think that CPA would be crazy not to want you to come and talk about that. Okay, awesome. Thanks for sharing. I appreciate it. Yeah. Lots of new names here today, guys. Any, anyone taking the course and there's any questions you have or anything you you don't fully understand? Rosie, I see your hand up now. Sorry, I missed you. That's okay. So I wanted to ask a question on chat on how to do something that I'm already doing in a better way. I am a part of an investor group that I consistently show up once good good week, twice a week. It's a Zoom call. It's investors all over Texas, right? That I'm a part of. And I have selectively marketed as myself as a realtor investor so that the investors that are a good match become partners with me. But I'm also realizing that I'm leaving a lot of business on the table if everybody doesn't know me at full capacity. 
my biggest concern is that when I show up and I just make an introduction that, hey, I'm a realtor, investor-friendly realtor, first of all, I just don't want to do that. I want to have a true exclusive value that clearly sends message to the people who are going to be good fit. Second, a little bit when I try to raise my head, I become a magnet of a bunch of CMAs for investors, which I don't want to be. I don't want to do a bunch of CMAs for the deals they're putting offers on. Like, I want to partner up. So let's truly add value. And I have access to a lot more resources than just a realtor. So it sounds like you have dealt with that world or worked with, in that environment. How did you position yourself as a realtor who was well capable of an investor, but didn't become a magnet for it? I've been licensed since 2005. And yeah. I, I was a real estate agent is what I called myself. I wasn't a realtor until, let's see. I was briefly at Snowshoe for a little while in 2007. Like we, we became part of the association, then it went away. And I was, uh, and then and when in Maui, we were members. But I, I've never really connected with that, the title realtor. To me, that's just a, prof it's a professional designation. It's not how I would define my career. So I've always looked at myself as a real estate expert or a real estate consultant. And when I got into Roanoke, where I was competing with everyone in that market who had been there their entire career, and I knew nobody and had no, no network, I used that to my advantage to differentiate myself. So I started as I was a real estate advisor. And the first thing people say is, well, what do you mean? And boom, that's what you got because you do away with all of their, the assumptions. So when you say realtor, it has negative connotations. We work in an industry that's made up it's there's an 88 percent failure rate the three-year mark like it replaces itself all the time and quite frankly most realtors aren't respected yeah. and for me it was like no i need people to i don't need people to assume they know something about me because i'm using this designation so i just stripped that out of everything i would as far as if, if i and i was more chad eventually i quit using business cards like i had business cards for my investment business cards for my real estate team and like i, I differentiated i was managing two brands and it became a lot and i eventually just put all that down quit giving business cards and when i would meet someone they're like hey what do you do i'm like oh i ride motorcycles climb rocks hang out with my family fish and they're like no professionally i'm like oh i thought you meant me and all of a sudden they're back on their heels they're like who the hell is this guy but it's different. I'm creating a, a yeah. differentiating point in their memory and an emotional response. So they're not going to forget that. So once, once I've got them open with that, I'm like, oh, I'm actually a real estate professional. And then I'm intentionally quiet because I want to see if they're going to engage with me. What, what do you mean? Like you buy things or you're a realtor or, and then I'll say something like, yeah. And then I'll be quiet again. And it's, you'll filter out some people, like the people who are going to use you, I find they'll go away. Like they'll awkwardly run out of questions to ask. And you can always engage and be like, Hey, hey listen, I, it's, it's what I do is a lot different. That's why I, I just wanted to make sure what, what we were talking about here and you can rope them back in the right person will be like, that's interesting. Tell me more about that. Like you real estate professional, what, what's your specialty? And they'll start asking good questions. And that's when you know you have a good investor on your hands. The, when I was first building my buyer's list of my investor list in Roanoke, the approach I took, I didn't want to be just a realtor. And I didn't really feel like I had the, I had bought and sold a couple houses, but I still didn't feel like with a seasoned investor who was holding 50 to hundred assets, if I'm out there saying oh, my title is equal to yours, I don't think that's fair either. And I didn't want him to, I didn't want him to compare and be like, oh, you're not a fucking investor. I'm an investor. I have 50 houses. So I just went with real estate professional, real estate expert, real estate advisor. And then the questions started coming. And my best buyers came from those conversations. Like Mike, my, the guy that ended up being the contractor I used on all of my flips. I sold it. I re literally ran the guy out of money, but his balance sheet exploded. I ran him out of cash because he was like, I've never, like, he's, we go through three or four realtors a year because they just won't freaking do the work and never bring us the right deals. He's, I've never met anyone like you. You ran me out of money in three months. I'm like, great. How can we make more? Let me help you scale your contracting business. And then I'll have more money to spend on, on, you can spend on commission. And that conversation started that way. So what I would recommend is get the hell outside of the box and just get rid of any title that anyone else in the room might be using, get rid of. And you could be Rosie, the rainmaker, whatever it might be. The title doesn't matter as much as 
the engagement that title gets you. And you may consider going away from things like business cards. I know most people roll their eyes at me when I like, I don't do digital business cards. Like when someone says, Hey man, let's keep in touch. You have a card. I'm like, no, better yet. Hand me your phone and I'll put my information in their phone. So I know it's there or things like that. So I do something that's very different because it creates that, that's that memory and that sticking point. So they never forget me. And that's how I've done it. Like I know that idea might not scale for everybody, but that's how I was able to really make myself stand out. Yeah, no, I'm very much appreciating what you're saying, Chad, because I have been a realtor alone. And when I didn't have awareness around all the things that I'm doing now, and the biggest challenge is that you pick up a phone or you talk to a client who has a little bit of a problem. And if they think that you're the normal person who just buys and sells and they have a bigger problem than that, there's good luck on getting that person on the phone again. Or there was always a commission fight. I got tired of that conversation, objections you can handle. I'm really enjoying not being a realtor and being a real estate advisor, even with normal seller leads, because this lady was expecting me to call her back with her missing air issue. She's, I'm not worried about her going to other people because we have such a big rapport and she has been able to dig her problem so much further with me because I'm not just a realtor. So I am acquiring this, acquiring this opportunity with the investment group where these investors who join these investment REIs and stuff, they have deals. They have sellers that they have come across who needs to get their house sold. They want to partner up with me and I'm not wanting them to come to me just for a CMA. <laughs> I want to do investment with me. So I want to know how, do, I think you answered my question that I should probably just show up in the, in the zoom calls and now start taking that spot where every vendor is talking about what they're, they have to offer. I say I'm a real estate advisor. Here, here's something to try. And I know you have the personality enough to stand up with this, go into your zoom settings and where your name is, put a hyphen and hashtag, not just a realtor. And the next time you show up on that Zoom call, it's going to say Rosie Hayer, hashtag not just a realtor. And that is where you can start that conversation. Seriously, everyone on this call is looking at your name right now on the bottom line. Yes, Chad. So start it there and make that part of the conversation. <laughs> what I'm seeing is not just dot. You may even take your name off and just do hashtag not just a realtor. But things like that. And you can, when the Zoom call begins, jump over and chat and be like, hey guys, my name's Rosie. You can copy and paste this on every freaking phone call. Hi, this is Rosie, not just a real, realtor hair. Here's, here are the ways I think I can help everybody today. Thanks for including me. And start, initiate that in every phone call, paste that in the Zoom chat before the call or when the call starts. So you build your damn brand in there. And, yeah. and get the attention you're... Yeah, because I feel like, but they don't know how to put the money together, how to talk to a seller. Like we have so much training as realtors, realtors to speak with that seller and have that extensive knowledge. And uh, they're willing to do the deal. And I'm getting deals and this is without the marketing. And I want to now show up. I feel ready for that announcement that, hey, let's do deals together. So I like, I'm going to actually go in today. It's today evening. So you may have, you, I'm sure you've probably heard this story, but the way I did this was my second REI meeting. I was driving 125 miles across two mountains just to go to the REI Real Estate Investors Association meeting because I thought I was going to move to Roanoke. What I noticed in, in these conversations, they're like, who are you? What do you do? I'm like, oh, I'm a real estate professional. And they're like, what the hell does that mean? You're a realtor? No, actually I'm not. I'm moving. I was just getting into investment. I'm moving from Hawaii, looking for a market where I can invest. I've got cash. I'd be willing to be a lender. I would be willing to partner on deals. I'm looking for a mentor. And I was trying different things on for size. What I realized is in that room, literally almost everyone was operating their business uh, anecdotally. So they didn't really know what the median price was in this zip code or that zip code. They didn't know the difference between the median and the average. They didn't know what cap rate was used in for residential. They didn't really under, they, like they, they were just operating off of anecdotal, their, their own experience. So I was like, aha, here's an opportunity. So what I did, I went and pulled a year's worth of MLS data, a year's worth of GIS data, combined it. So I had a whole picture of the real estate market and I boiled it down into reports that showed by zip code and by type. So cash financed or cash institutionally financed or owner financed. And then of the institutionally financed, which loan products were used in each zip code, what the median price was, what the average price was. 
and what was the difference between a, a retail deal and a wholesale deal showing that. And I made a report that just blew their minds because no, no one had ever done that. It took me quite a bit of time, but everything changed that third meeting or the, I guess it would have been the fourth meeting, the third meeting, I talked to Dallas. I'm like, hey, man, look at this. Did you, do you know all these things? He's like, where the hell did you get this? I'm like, I made it. And he's like, you're presenting next week. And this is the guy that started it. After I presented, and one of my best friends in the world is still like, uh, that night, we stood there and talked two o'clock in the morning in a parking lot because he was a finance and computer science major at Virginia Tech. And he was like, oh. so anyways, Mike, is, he's now, because of that night, he got into wholesaling. And he is now running, he's done about four and a half, he'll probably break $6 million in revenue this year as a wholesaler. And he started that night. I've got lifetime friendships from that, from doing that. I've, I've sold hundreds and hundreds of houses to the investors, but I only had to do it one time. Yeah. Like that one yeah. time was enough. It's all, that's, oh, that's Chad. He's different because he did, he does this. And these guys picked me up and one guy picked up the phone. He said, Hey man, I know we haven't talked in two or three years. I'm going to buy and Can you get me out? And he had 58 houses that he needed to drop, to drop like a hot potato because he put his head in the sand and let, let the clock hit 12. Like the clock was on 1155. And luckily I had a relationship with the banker. I was able to hold them at bay and, and, and blow out his portfolio, but I hadn't been to that group in two, two or three years. I hadn't even showed up to meetings, but that one thing that I did made such a difference. So I want each of you like, think, what is that unique value that you can put into that group to create that, that boom, you remember when that guy did that. And I don't, it, it may be some sort some sort of market analysis every is different. Some are more professionally run than others. It's amazing speakers every week, and it's hard to find anything they haven't done. But who can you bring to the table? What can you bring to the table that's really going to, everyone, where everyone in the room is going to go, I'll be damned. That lady taught me something tonight. And again, why not, why not the tough basis thing? Take something fresh right now. Go educate, you, the, educate yourself on the history of the step-up basis on what, and think about what that means for the average American family who has to sell the home because they, they need 80% of net worth is held in, in real estate. And there's only $24,000 in liquidity in the average senior citizen's net worth. So what does that mean? What does that mean for Austin? What does it mean for small businesses, multi-generational small businesses? If the family can't afford to settle out of the estate and they have to sell the small business, and half of that wealth goes to taxes, then what is that? So maybe bring things like that are a bit contentious, a bit unsettled. There, it's a theoretical conversation at this point until we have the piss and match in, in DC, but it will get you remembered. Right? Like, oh, that one thinks different. She's actually seeing that this is going to fragment family, but generational wealth. And they're going to think, wow, she must not just be just a realtor. All right, I better go talk to her. Hashtag not just the realtor. So anything like that will really make you stand out and make get them to think outside of the box. No. So. Thank you so much. I'm definitely going to give it a shot. And uh, 1031s too, Rosie. Huh? So the, the two things that I think are on the table, and I don't, this isn't a political conversation. This is a generational wealth conversation. But I think two things that really threaten housing, uh, threaten generational wealth and housing is the step up basis going away as part of, of the proposed changes. I think that that's going to be terrible for a lot of, not the uber, uber wealthy, but families who have small businesses, who have family farms that have been together, that have been salvaged over years. And then the other thing is the 1031, if the changes come through on 1031, that limit your 1031 advantage to a half a million dollars, that is going to drive institutional money into residential assets and create a hell of a lot of competition for every investor in that room. So if you really want to stir up some concern and you want it to apply to every ass and every seat in that room, go educate yourself on the history of 1031, the benefits of 1031. And it's not, frankly, it's not as beneficial as most people think. If you're always increasing your income, it, it, you're just running from, it's not a very good game to play. It seems attractive, but you're just going to pay a higher tax rate in the future. Yeah. So for me, it's not anything I ever wanted to do. I would rather invest from taxable accounts and, and get write-offs than try to build my real estate portfolio into a damn retirement account. But some people are already heavily invested in those and they're going to be forced to continue to play that game. They'll be forced to buy lower priced assets. So they're not showing those big massive gains like they were in office or retail or multifamily. So talk about how that can affect 
Austin, Texas. You've got some insane valuations in that city now. And a lot of that money came in as 1031 money. Now, there's REITs yeah. that are doing 1031s. There's Delaware Statutory Trust that bought up those old industrial buildings and turned them into condos. And that's 1031 money. So what happens when they get done with that disposition? What are they coming after? Are they going to pay that giant tax bill? Or are they going to be competing with you over here in the suburbs and start that start, be the one that starts that conversation in the group and bring a CPA to the table and be like, Hey, listen, I'm not here to just stir things up. There's some things that we can do preemptively to protect ourselves and get ready for this. I'd like to introduce you to CPA, like not just a CPA, Bill Jones and bring that guy to the table, bring the expert or bring a 1031 expert, but try to make it somebody from your local market, from wherever it is, if you can find them in Austin. But anyway, those are just two things that are, are like right now, very relevant and very unknown. And like I said, it'll, it'll be a theoretical conversation, but you can show, listen, I'm on the leading edge. I'm a thought leader in this space. And mm -hmm. I'm going to bring you what information I think might be valuable to help you protect your assets and mitigate some of these risks that I see coming. Yeah. And they'll, yeah. they'll respect the hell out of that. No, I really like it. I think the 1031 is anything that impacts our supply and demand, like these trust people buying properties at large scale is increasing the demand, which is driving the prices up. So anything that is impacting the supply and demand in a real estate market, I can I really like what you said because I can bring all my alliances and call them not just a PPA, not just an IRA specialist. There's so much more than that. And they happen to create, I can just create a little own group like that where I interview people and my investors get to see it and my buyers get to see it. I think you gave me some really good uh, head start here. And uh, I'm excited because the deals I was doing with one investor already, I was like, what's stopping me from doing it with everyone? Who's willing to do it? There are some people who are just wanting a small CMA. I can have one of my admin on the CMA. It's not a big deal, but I didn't want to uh, become that person because in investor group, I have learned one thing. You got to have a little bit of a thick skin because realtors are roasted. <laughs> I don't have a problem with, I, I'm not too identified being a realtor. That's why it doesn't offend me. But I also am very dying to ask the question, what do you see as an ideal realtor partner like? Who do you see that? You haven't manifested that in y'all's world yet, but has anybody taken the time to really go down a survey and what is an ideal image of a perfect realtor investor partner? The one who understands market, you're going on antidotal knowledge. You don't know how to even write a contract or how to negotiate HOA fees or even work with title or make sure it's even ready to close or not. So the real estate knowledge is missing, but you are in front of sellers putting properties under contract. You need someone who can verify. There is a huge partnership here. But until I have clarity around what value I would like to personally show up for at scale, it's hard. To, it was hard for me to claim my stake and say, I'm a realtor, just come to me because I didn't want all the attention. I wanted an attention with her. I'm racking my brain to try to think of the name of a piece of technology in my mastermind in order to really get people engaged in the beginning of a zoom call, they'll oftentimes do a survey. Like, where in the world are you today? And we, like, in real time, you'll click a link in the chat, type it in, and then it produces, like, a word cloud on the page. There's others where you could, like, the same software, you can ask, like, survey questions. Okay, of everybody in here, who's ever, like, how many realtors have you had to go through while building your investment business? And take a, take a poll. They can see real time. I hit that. Okay. Sorry. Anyways, I'll try to find that software, but what, where I'm going with this is you could, as long as the members are willing to let you, do you have an, what's the format? Do you have an opportunity? To it's a very similar format as you, the main person who started that group, like the chat of the group is hosting it. I, they have highlighted me um, gracefully more than enough, right? Like I have a position, cool. like the main person who started the REI group, the investor group that I'm part of. They're investors all over Texas and every week around 69 to 70 people show up. There. And I get so much attention in that, that I'm not monetizing on it because I don't have clarity around my audience. Not everybody in there is going to be working with me at scale. But so this is a, it's a fun way to 
be remembered in the group, but also get something like you could put up a type form and just drop a survey link in the chat and a few people are going to fill it out. Yeah. But if you can get the sponsor of the call, like the, the host of the call, if you can get them to, to agree, Hey, that sounds like something fun to do. Hey guys, listen, this week, Rosie, not just a realtor hair, had a couple really interesting questions that she asked if she could ask in front of the group. And I really think we're all going to learn something here. So Rosie, go ahead and drop the link. And then you drop a link in the chat and then he'll actually display it. So you can collaborate with him. But like the questions I would be looking for is how many of you work with realtors versus source your own deals off market? And then you want to, you'll see a percentage. You'll see 75% work with realtors, 25% don't. And then ask another question is what's the number one thing that realtors do for you today? And then put up like a multiple choice. It could be, it might come at you in a word cloud, or you could do like a multiple choice with six options or more than just two or three, but it's going to show you in real time, 70 people, their opinions and their, like what they're currently doing. And then start getting into things like, what is the biggest problem you have when trying to find an investment friendly realtor? and put those things out there. And, and so anyways, you could do it where it's an interactive survey almost. And I wish I could find, I wish I could remember the name of that software. Yeah, it. is yeah. something against me just saying, I'm an investor and I'm a realtor. I'm not just a realtor, but I have a real estate license. I'm looking for partners. Yeah, no, that's good. But I'm, I'm looking for things for creative ideas for her. Absolutely. And that's what she's saying. I'm looking for ways to her, for her to stand out on a zoom call. But anyway, if the organizer is willing to let you do that, you can do a survey that everybody could learn from. Even the guys who like, who aren't going to work with you, they're going to be like, I'll be damned. I guess I'm not the only one. And you like, they can see that other people are having trouble, but yeah. And, and like Martha said, anything you can do to really drive that home. Listen, I'm a realtor and I can help you there, but I'm predominantly here because I want to provide, I want to, I want to do deals. Like that, that's a job and being an investor is a career. The one of the purposeful thing I had done is that because I was learning probate from here, I took this title and I advertised in the investor group because these people are coming across deals who don't want to but work with an investor, they want to sell on the market. And uh, a lot of uh, probate referrals started coming from the investor group for that reason. So they do see me as a probate specialist. But yeah, so that was a good way for listings. But I'm, I'm, I think I got enough content to work on. I'm going to show up as not just a realtor. I think it's a really good time to play with and the survey because if you get and 1031 exchange and the CPA conversation, I think between this three, I can uh, stir up enough audience to get something out and I'll bring back to the team. Mike, no last name. I see you have a hand up. Hey, Chad. So I've been wanting to call for the last couple of weeks. I need some ideas. I've been with ATL as a subscriber getting leads in Northern Colorado and Southern Wyoming since November. I've only had one lead I've talked to and she's going to list with the realtor this. I'm an investor only. She's going to li li uh, list with the realtor this week, which I've known for a while. I got her a clean out crew back in February or something like that. I helped her get a, take care of the auction piece of it, which was all fine and dandy. But I'm looking for ideas on what you think I should do. Spend what, seven months, eight months and only one lead come out of that. About 30, I think 30 to 50 is probably the average number in, in my county. But I'm just looking for ideas. What do you think I should do next? What, Where should I be going here? What, the, which Colorado County? Is it on the east side or west side? No, it's Weld County. About a north, okay, uh, uh, I know where it is, north. but you're on the east, northeastern part of the state. Yep. Yeah. So your data is seasoned. That's one of those markets where they're actually holding your probate data until the probate data recording, when, when it becomes a matter of public record, is actually upon completion. So most of the assets are going to go ahead and transfer while probate is open but a number of them will not. Like they will go ahead and change title, inherit the property, and then they'll sell it. So it's a longer game to play in Colorado. Now I have, we have brokerage. When I was with all the leads, I coached a gentleman in Laramie, Weld, and one other county up there, right where you are though. And in four months, we came up short. He was a Mike Ferry guy. He was all about repetition. He was all about tracking every metric and we were just hitting walls. And I'm like, man, I won't give up if you won't, Fred. And he's like, all right, let's keep going. Eventually he called me and he's four months in. He's like, man, I've got no ROI. What do I do? And I'm like, I want you to stop paying for the leads, but I want you to keep prospecting. 
because I, I just I do not believe everybody's been helped. And we went for another two or three weeks after stopping. So we were like four and a half months in and he nailed six deals in one week. And he's basically held that pace from then forward. So it was a slow buildup for him. But what he found is the people that went ahead and inherited the property and still hadn't done anything, they were the biggest procrastinators of all the procrastinators. They procrastinated so much, they couldn't even make a decision. They went ahead and transferred title into their names. And then eventually they would finally call him and, and get it done. So probably not the answer you want to hear you're eight months in it's usually not that long of a game usually inside of six months you've built some momentum and you're doing deals so i would look at what your offer is and and do you know if you have any competition there right now do you know of other people who are specializing in it i don't think so when i talked to the team over there bruce and whatever the gal's name is darcy i think i had competition in larimer county which is over in fort collins but i think they've dropped out now and definitely nobody in weld and I got some archive leads out of Laramie County, Wyoming, which is Cheyenne. So now with Wyoming, I don't think it's the case. I think the data there is reported upon the petition. So that, that doesn't actually hold up on, on the Wyoming side. We got to look at your offer, right? Are you offering brokerage services, even though you don't care to fulfill those? Is that part of your offer? I've not offered brokerage services. I was doing the calls from November to January. And I went ahead and I think I emailed you or something. I used Steve Lindover at Voice Logic since February through mm -hmm. my calls, but I don't think brokerage is part of that. Okay. Offer. There's a reason we tell you to build a team and offer all of these things because, yeah, we're only going to directly monetize one or two of them, but it really differentiates us. So if usually when people are coming up short, it's because the marketplace is responding and saying your offer is not valuable to me. So let's look at, at the letters that, that you have at all the leads. Those are all ones that I proofed out with my own dollars. There's one that you might want to try, and it may be a little too woo-woo for you. I don't know, but there's one called Probate Social Enterprise. And I wrote that as, it actually, you mail it to the decedent. But I, I wrote that, it's more of, it looks more like a farming letter. And it's uh, and tongue in cheek the way it's written, but it's, you know, what we do really isn't a big deal. We just, like R Rosie, we just do A, B, C, D, E, F, G, like all these things. But that one is, I wrote that letter for Colorado Springs because one of the same situation was happening south of you. So I wrote the probate social enterprise letter and I also wrote the, the probate home, va it's house value or home value. But anyways, those two letters were written for your market and they worked both of them did and it was just a different approach than anyone else so check out those two letters if you go into the subscriber portal mailbox motivator if they haven't moved them around you should be able to find both of those but maybe try to change up your letter and your offer and your phone script to include to be a little more inclusive and just like i was telling rosie the hashtag not just a realtor and that's just it's a differentiator so the probate social enterprise letter basically says, hey, my name's Chad. I'm the owner of a social enterprise here in, in Laramie County. What that means is, and you just start to explain it to them. So you're, and they're like, what in the hell? Who is this guy? I don't really understand what he does. And you're building up curiosity. When they flip the page over, it's like, we find real estate to be the biggest challenge for most families. Here are the options. Option one, do nothing. Let it sit there and incur costs and get in worse condition. And like I said, it's a little tongue in cheek. It's facetiously written. Option two, transition it into a family owned rental property. Option three, sell it wholesale. Option four, fix it up. And, and it introduces them to like to show them these are all the things you could do. So instead of you mailing them or, or talking to them as just an investor, you're saying here are all the things you can do, including sit on your ass and let this property lose value. It's okay. That's your prerogative. But I think change your approach for a bit. Are you okay cash flow wise? I'm in corporate America. That's that's the reason. One of the reasons I, I was doing the call in the beginning and hired Steve. So yes, it's not breaking the bank. So I got a little bit of money. We can go out just for another couple months, but I got a call with Bruce as well, maybe on Thursday. I am, and they're doing it. Hey, all the leads is doing the direct mail. And I'm out, and I've done the four touches, I think, on all of them. Two archives up in Cheyenne, one in uh, December, and one just, I think, in April, I want to say. Kind of different things. Tell me what you've done to build your attorney referral network. I have three attorneys I've talked to just through the court conversation and, and RIA meetings. I was going to the, on the Zoom, we do Zoom calls. So I've got three plus an additional attorney that I talked to 
I've not done anything to market to them other than just if I, if they're at the meeting, I'll touch base with them or on the call I'll touch base with them. Okay. In Wyoming, this is probably not that relevant in Colorado because of the delay in recording, but in any given market, in the country, usually 20% of probate leads that are recorded on the petition do not have legal representation. So you can find those ones and in, in look at your leads and look at the attorney column. Um, if you see that they don't, if there are ones in Laramie, Wyoming that don't have an attorney, use that to open the door and start some new relationships up there to say, hey, listen, we reach out to every family with an offer multiple services. But every month I notice there's five or 10 that don't have an attorney. So when we talk to them, we all, we suggest that they go ahead and hire an attorney now versus later cleaning up the mess. I'd like to, to find an attorney that I can trust to refer those to. Have I called the right number or have I showed up in the right office? And see if you can use those pro se or pro per, those without legal counsel. See if you can use those to build some more relationships. In Colorado, that's a big part of the game. If you want to get the, the early, get there during probate, the only way to know is to pay $5 court access and go in and then $5 per lead to get each one out during while it's in the petition or the probate phase, or get to know every damn attorney you can. And just don't worry about buying probate leads, get them from the attorneys. There's still value to those leads that clear probate and some of them still hold real estate. And this is just anecdotal, but I would guess it's maybe 10% of the estates will actually go ahead and transfer title in the pro at to close out the probate and then they'll sell the asset. So there's obviously value to those, but if you, I would say double down on, on change your letter and change your offer, be, be, have a more, have an offer that can appeal to every single family. So make sure you're talking about all the different things you can do to help the social enterprise letter does a good job at that. But also re really work those attorneys, man. What's your get your job in corporate America? What's your W-2? I run a telecom construction, doing fiber backhaul, 5G work. Been doing that for 35 years. Man, you got $2 trillion pointed at you. You should I take do. what you take what you learned. Yeah. I'll, I'll do this with you. I'm trying. I'm looking for small business plays in the way of that infrastructure package. I'm looking to buy like right. bucket truck companies. I'm looking to buy fiber companies like... So like, honestly, man, take what you've learned in your W-2 and get in front of this infrastructure package. Okay. Anyway, so those are some ideas. Let us know if there's, if you read those letters, see what you think. Um, let us know how it works out. And there's always something that works, Mike. This is what I tell the Colorado people, even from the very get go, if you're going to commit to this in the, in Colorado, you've got to be patient until we can find what works and keep raising your hand. If you do something and it doesn't work, let us know. We'll come, there's always yeah, a better yeah. idea. How, and how so, long should I have tried that for? If I change it again, should I just three months you think, or four months or what's your opinion? If I change letters, how long letter run? For how many, months? you have eight months of leads in two counties? Yeah. So you have almost 500 leads, right? I must at 30 to 50. Yeah. hundred. Well, it's a little low, probably 180 to 300 probably because it's 30 to 60. Last month was the highest. I think it was 58. Here's what I would do first is think of this as a campaign. So if you like, pick one, pick whichever of those letters you like the most fired off to every single lead you've ever gotten, and then do a follow-up campaign on the phones. That's consistent with that letter. So if it was the probate social enterprise letter, you want Lindo's people to say, hey, this is Chad Corbett. I'm calling from ABC probate. We're a social enterprise right here in Laramie County. And we try to reach out to every family before, during, and after probate. I noticed that, that you were the administrator of an estate. Is that still the case? Okay, great. Uh, listen, Mike is, is not available today, but anyone who most, we, we see most families struggle with the assets in the estate. Have you guys dealt with all of the assets and especially the real estate? Okay. But almost like a survey from a social enterprise, they've never heard that before. They're like, what the hell is a social enterprise? Whether they say it or not, that's what they're thinking. And what you can say is, well, we're, think of us as altruistic entrepreneurs. We actually care more about what the value to you is than what, what value we get back. And if we, if we're giving value, we know we always get more than we deserve, yada, yada. But change that conversation up to match the letter and run back through those five, so 500 letters, 500 calls. And then 
take what you've learned. Like the, the ISA should, they should keep track of, they should know what objections they're hearing or how many of them sold, but learn what you can from that. And then we'll adjust from there. I wouldn't say put that same letter on deck and pay for four of them. Let's do little tweaks and test and then re regroup and look at it. What did we learn from that? And then other ideas will surface. Like yeah. That. And Tom was suggesting more follow-up calls and you actually making the calls, but it sounds like you either don't have the time or the energy after your really serious day job. That's more time of anything. Like I said, I tried it from November to January. And it's like, oh boy, the new, new, new year kicked in and we're rural broadband's going. So yes, I thought Lindo, Lindo, I, I'm guessing he does a good job. He's got a good team. I took you guys opinion of that. I suggest him because I've been in his call center and I've seen first round campaigns. And the first one I ever did with his people was in Orange County, Florida in Orlando, which is a really competitive market. And hell, they had off a hundred phone calls, seven appointments. So that's outstanding for a call. For sure. I yeah. think it has a lot to do with Colorado in the whole probate process here in Colorado. Eight months is getting a little long, but I got a little bit more patience to me. And I like that idea. I like the last one. I'll pick a new letter, still social media letter and or uh, social engagement letter that can mail to all 500 and see what happens. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for raising your hand, my man. Don't ever hesitate. It, keep coming back until we find the idea that works. I've yet to be skunked. Colorado is the hardest damn market that you could ever do this in. And not to discourage you, I've coached people through and well into six digits of income there. It just took some time. And you might also, we talked about connecting with Dave Glenn on the beginning of this phone call. You might also want to connect with Dave. He's not competing with you. Um, he's working down in Denver and over in Florida, but you might want to connect with him and, and learn from him. He's done a really good, he's been doing this for, gosh, I bet five years now. And he's on these calls sometimes. I don't see him today, but you may want to, you may want to buy him some beers, pick his brain. Yeah, I already friended him. As soon as you mentioned his name. I okay, cool. Face. And here's the one thing, you know, I would like to say that in my years of doing this, I've never seen anybody quit, but that's just, <laughs> that's not true. I would say, and you don't have to make a commitment to be, but maybe to yourself, don't quit until you've got at least broken even on this. Like it works everywhere. Yeah. If, if you're willing to stay engaged, at least stick around long enough that I can get you to make your money, show you how to make your money back. That'd I hate when people like you realize <laughs> it's like selling a shitty stock, right? Yeah, no, it'd be great. I'm not for sure. All right. Thanks for being here, Mike. Fed hashtag suave. How are you? <laughs> hashtag not just all you have to do is get a, get a vet. You look sharp, brother. I've seen you walking around this beautiful structure. Where are you? Is it yeah, I'm at a broker open. Actually, I have a broker open right now. And uh, a, I have offers due tonight. Yeah, it's pretty It's nice. a cool house, man. Yeah, I was yeah. looking, when you were walking around earlier, I'm like, holy. Yeah, nice. it's nice. There's a really cool outdoor area, too, that has like a fire pit and uh, cabana and all that stuff. That's really cool. I'll take you there. In the meantime, I'll ask you a question. Since you were talking about buying people beers, I'll gladly buy you a beer if you send me an investor. I have a uh, <laughs> listing coming up in uh, San Diego, believe it or not. I heard it out out and the client i get the grandma doesn't trust anyone and she's no i want you uh, to handle it all right so she's 95 i gotta go there because she doesn't have computers or anything no docusign so i gotta go do all the paperwork with her tomorrow sorry on saturday but i was thinking since it's a single family residence and but it's zoned r3 it's realistically for a developer if any investors feel free to let this guy know i'll send you a lot of beer as much beer as oh, let's do this fed send me an email with yeah. with the, the details you know what you're mm -hmm. pricing it at i know they want to walk away after commissions and everything with 1 million i was originally thinking of pricing it at 9.99 because a single family residence built in 1957 a lot of illegal stuff but realistically since the zoning is r3 i don't think anyone's going to keep it as, as an sfr it, but instead, it's just going to tear it down and build multi-unit. Will they partner? If they end up making more money, will they partner? Yeah. I, look, the, I, I, I want to show up there since I essentially uh, basically have no competition. I know the personal rep. It's not. It, okay. They have a trust. And because the grandmother who owns the house is 95, they already have everything set up in case she passes away to not have to go through probate. They want to just get her as much money as possible. So I think whatever option we can offer them that will allow them to walk away with that. I don't, no problem here. Like, I don't think it matters so, if we're on the market or not, as long as we get the money. 
Man, this sounds like a perfect JV opportunity where you yeah. establish you establish the million dollar basis for the house. Yep. You you roll it over into a, a trust or an, a new LLC. You yep. bring a yep. you bring a builder in, raise the structure, put it back as plant you know plan permitted, and either yep. finish yep. it out and then close them like close them out on the appraised value. So let's say that let's say you go to mixed use retail on the ground floor and a duplex up yeah. top um, and let's say that that appraises at two million dollars there's a million dollar net gain in there so you would pay them a half you would pay them a half a million dollars you would pay them a million and a half at that point yeah, yeah. they could yeah. you know do a cash out refi the family gets a million and a half instead of a million and they end up with five hundred thousand dollars equity in a new development nice. so that's the yeah. kind of th this is the perfect kind of scenario for one of those deals and yeah. If you can give me the details on it, like yeah, yeah, whatever yeah. you think I'll would be important. You. I definitely yeah. have guys with cash in that market that, that are capable of doing this. Yeah, I figured I'd reach out because I spoke to her a few days ago and I spoke to her, her granddaughter who actually has power of attorney with everything. And she said, look, she just, we just want to get her the most amount of money. And we, she just said, we've never done this. So please don't take advantage. I'm like, I'm not here to take advantage of people. I'm here to help people. And you're free to work with whoever you feel comfortable with. I can come over and show you how I can get you the most amount of money. And then if I'm the right person for you, I'd be more than happy to, to lead you through the process. So that's how I went. And she said, look, bring all the paperwork and uh, on Saturday and let's sign. That's awesome. But I figured I'd reach out to you first. And, uh, and just see if we could get this done another way instead of just going traditional route. I've definitely got some guys that'll look at it. Cool. Yeah, it's, uh, it's located in Carlsbad. Yeah, sounds, I'll, I'll send you everything as soon as I get I get back. Cool. Thanks so much, Fed. Hey, thank and you. Thank I you. was just I just looked over in, in the comments. Tom had mentioned, and I think this was probably when we were working on your thing, Mike. Run Probate Plus. That's something that is probably I think it's certainly worth doing with your list. If you have 500 leads, before you pull the trigger on the call campaign and the direct mail for two dollars per lead you can run probate plus and bring back all of the real estate information including which ones have already sold and then go through and mark just make your change your opt-outs and any that, that have showed transfers on the real estate opt them out of mail and opt them out of phone calls and then do an export of your mailing list and your calling list you'll probably end up saving a considerable amount of money. Probate Plus was created for that reason. I was able to cut marketing costs by 45% just by running the Probate Plus augmentation. So good suggestion, Tom. I wasn't even thinking about that. I would do that before you start, Mike. Okay, that sounds good. I've got Probate Plus in the first several months of them. So perfect. I'll do that. Yeah, cool. All right, guys, as much as I hate to, I'm going to go build a deck in 95 degree heat. Thank you guys for being here. And as always, for everybody who contributed, Fed, that sounds like a good deal, man. And you got to make some YouTube videos while you're there today. Like you are looking the Lord, you're like, thank oh, you, it's, it's a you. day off. I'm just stuck here. <laughs> I'm thinking about selling this place. It's small. It's like, is there a Lambo out front? <laughs> All right. Reach out later. Guys, thank you. have a good day. Thanks so much for being here and being part of our community.